Well, welcome to our short video series all about hiring. If you're in a hiring process, this series is for you. It'll even be helpful for you if you want to get hired. You can take some of the tips and tools that I'm going to talk about here and it'll help you shape the hiring process. So let's dive in. Walter Riston, who's the inventor of the ATM, love him or hate him, right? And the former president of Citibank and Citibank Corporation said, if you have the wrong person in the job, there is nothing known to man that can save you. <laughs> True, huh? <laughs> so how do you hire? the right people. Well, here's what we've learned. Always be recruiting, even when you don't think you're going to need somebody for a specific position or for a type of position. And two, always hire for competencies, not just skills. So let's unpack those two things for you in this first video. Here's how we do this. First of all, when you're hiring for competencies, start by defining the competencies that the position requires. Now, a competency is different from a skill. Our competencies show up everywhere all the time, and skills show up only when they're needed. Curiosity, for example, is a competency, and reading is a skill. Velocity of thought, how quickly someone thinks, that's a competency. Being organized is a skill. Drive and grit and determination, those are competencies. But prioritizing and managing your time and doing things in the right order, well, those are skills. So if you get clear about the competencies that the position you're hiring for requires, everything else will flow well from there. Do the work in defining your competencies clearly. Then hire for competencies. It's harder at first, it takes more upfront energy and time, but it will really pay off in the long run. If you hire for skills, you'll get the skills, but you may also get a lot of other stuff that make the skills irrelevant over time. <laughs> so once you've defined the competencies, you're gonna want somebody in this position to possess, well then search both formally and informally for those competencies whenever you interact with that candidate. You'll be asking and you'll be listening for stories that reveal that person's competencies in play. You'll also ask questions like, can you tell me a story about when you have demonstrated, for example, curiosity, or when you've demonstrated quick thought or velocity of thought, or could you tell me a story about tenacity or drive or grit, something like that. Just tell me stories about when that happened. You want to do that formally and informally as you get to know that candidate. So there'll be more on that in the next video, in the interview process video that's part of this series. And, and when you're able to do that, you'll be able to get at more clearly at whether or not the person possesses those competencies. So be careful along the way. Don't get distracted from this discovery of their competencies by focusing on their skills. A rocket scientist who's lazy and can't get along with people or takes every joke personally and is easily offended is a bad hire no matter how good they are at the technical part of their job, no matter how good they are at their skills. You need the full package. So skills are great, but they can be taught as long as you have the right competencies. Competencies, however, take a little bit longer and they're a little bit harder to develop. Hire people who already have the competencies when they walk in the door. So what are some of the competencies that you need in any type of position? Most positions that have any sort of influence or leadership or decision making uh, responsibility at all. Here are some of the competencies that are likely to fit in almost any position that you are going to be hiring for. Velocity of work, which I mentioned earlier. Velocity of thought, mentioned that as well. How quickly people get at their work once they realize something needs to be done. Do they sit back and think forever about it or do they dive in? Do they get the work done? That's called velocity of work. Also velocity of thought, how quickly do they think? How quickly do they get the idea? How fluid are their concepts? And do they get there quickly? Or do they think very, very, very slowly? Another competency you want to look for is grit. You know all about that. That's the ability to just keep going. The ability to downshift and just keep going. That's grit, regardless of what they feel like physically or emotionally. This might be a surprise to you, but one of the most important competencies that we look for when we are doing hiring in one of our enterprises or supporting others is humor. 
does the person have a good sense of humor that fits the style of humor of the workplace where they will be? If people are humorless, it usually means that they don't know how to prioritize very well. They're probably not very humble as well either. Another core competency you want to have in place, I mentioned above, is curiosity. Are they genuinely respectfully curious about how things work, how things really are, what they don't know, what's around the corner? Genuine respectful curiosity. Also, another competency that we look for is what I have come to call other focus. Compare that with me focus. It's not all about me. It should be about us and, and, the, and the team and what we're trying to accomplish. Not all about me. The next core competency you want to look for out of the eight here that I'm suggesting is self management. Now, self-management as a core competency really is made up of self-awareness. Do they get their strengths and their weaknesses and their impact on other people? And self-control. Do they know how to pump the brakes when they need to and push on the accelerator when they need to so that they can get the results that they're after? And the last of the, core, core, uh, of the key core competencies that I think you need to look for, almost regardless of the position that you're hiring, is what I like to call robustness. At least they're resilient, but mostly a robust person is somebody who's better because of the storm. They don't just get through the storms. They're robust, and that arises from a whole series of disciplines. All right, so you get the idea, right? Hire for competencies. Skills are great. They're an added bonus. But if you have the competency without skill, you can train for the skills. All right, here's the second basic idea as we get started here. Not only are you hiring for competencies, but always be in recruiting mode even if you're fully staffed and no one is planning to leave. If you are growing in any way or the challenges that you're facing are growing in any way or people are planning on moving on and you don't even know about it, you want to always be in a recruiting mode. Here's what we've learned about recruiting. First of all, be the kind of workplace where people want to work. If you're not that kind of workplace, it's really hard to recruit. How do you do that? Well, make sure that clarity and alignment are king. Make sure that people are crystal clear about what matters and that they're pointing their efforts in the same direction. Clarity and alignment. Got a whole video about that in Leaders and how you have two jobs to create clarity and to create alignment. We'll put a link right up here on that for you so you can see that video when we're done here. Also, be the kind of place that, that people want to work by making sure you deal with poor performers. If you ignore poor performers or don't deal with them, then people are not going to want to work there. Because not only are they dragging that poor performer along, but all the work that person is not getting done is getting sloughed off onto them. So what makes another good place to work? Well, look in the mirror. Uh, would you want to work there if you didn't already? Huh. If you would not want to work where you are if you didn't already, you've got to change why. Make sure that that's the place where you spend some time and effort. Top surveys all say this about what makes a great place to work. It's not rocket surgery. It's pretty easy to see it, but check through this list with me and see if this, reply, if, if this applies to you. So all the surveys say you've got to have really good leadership. What that means is the leaders need to be present. They need to be engaged. The leaders need to, what a surprise, create clarity about vision and alignment of efforts. They're, the leaders need to create and have genuine respect and, and really in the most effective workplaces we've ever worked in and ever tried to create, the leaders have genuine respect and deep admiration for the people in the organization that they lead. Also, these really good workplaces have visible career growth paths with clarity about how a person can get there and how they can grow. They also have direct communication as the norm. They're a very low drama workplace. And these really good workplaces also have really, really good communication. It's important to know that, that even if we think we're good communicators, we probably under communicate in any kind of a sophisticated or complex organization by a huge factor. Some organizations we've gotten to work with under communicate by a factor of 10, and yet they think they are 9 out of 10 in their ability to communicate. Interesting. So if you're having a good workplace, the kind of workplace it's easy to recruit into, you also have an intentionally healthy culture. And you have a winning organization. You're either the best or you're the second best in your lane. That's important to know because it's much easier to recruit into those kind of organizations than into ones that have bad reputations. So. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, if you really want to recruit well, hire for competencies and train for skills. It occurs to me that 
when I use a phrase like uh, uh, a broken record that some of you might not even know what that means. <laughs> What's a record after all? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, hire for competencies, train for skills. All right, here's the third idea about recruiting. If you're going to always be recruiting, this means that you have set up a structure to always be recruiting. You need to define the ideal candidates through the lens of what, guess what, competencies. And then you need to constantly be recruiting around that. Is this job for you? Here are the competencies. Is this job for you? So set up the structures that do that. Think of organizations you're well aware of, public or private, uh, government or non-governmental, that are really good at recruiting. They have that approach. Here's who we are. Here's the kind of person that does well here. Here's what we do. Is that you? Do you uh, instead of just throwing a broad net, they narrow the net by defining the competencies. Also, as a leader, you know that leadership means that you are personally always recruiting. I have for a long time, together with my leaders, uh, built what we call hit lists. These are people that we meet or that we know about that eventually somewhere, sometime down the road, we want them to come and work for us. And it's been pretty effective. Some of our best hires have been folks that we put on a hit list and within a few weeks or months, even a couple of years, we eventually brought them into one of our organizations. We love that approach. So I know it's my job as a, as a senior leader in the organization to always be recruiting. I'm constantly looking for people who I'd love to have a part of my team. And I put them on a hit list and tell others about that. So also you want to be thinking about are your individuals, the people that, who are a part of your organization, you might call your team, your employees, are they always recruiting? Tell them you're expecting that they do that. And here's a quick test for you, by the way. If your team members and your employees are not recruiting, there's a problem. Either that employee is in the wrong person, uh, or I'm sorry, they're in the wrong job for that person. They don't quite fit, therefore they wouldn't want to recruit somebody into an unpleasant situation like they're in. Or they really don't want to be subjecting their friends and family to a difficult workplace or to a, a negative culture. So just between you and me, if that is happening and if people don't want to help that are working there already by recruiting people into positions in the organization, it usually means your workplace is not very healthy. It's not a very good place to work. I'm going to say that with all due respect, bless your heart. <laughs> okay. All right, enough of that unpleasantment. Um, it's important also to know that in, as you and I are recruiting in today's workforce, we need to know that it is different. And I'm not just when I say the following things, uh, applying age and stage differences, you know, kids nowadays, that kind of thing. It's the differences are on some level crossing age and stage. It's a very different workforce than it was just a little while ago. And these differences are accelerating. So on some level, regardless of the age or the stage in their career and in their life, most people I'm going to talk about here in the next minute or two are, are different in the workplace in, in a bunch of really interesting ways. So here are some of those ways the, workface, uh, the workforce today is different. Workers are today in a world that is connected by default. The expectation that some or most of our work can be done through connectivity and remotely is therefore in everybody's world. We need to get used to that. Connectivity is not going away. And, and the expectation that follows that I don't have to be in a specific place at a specific time to do part of my work is a logical explanation. So we got to adapt to that. A second difference that in today's workforce compared to ones in the past is that folks in the workforce expect clear and open communication as a minimum prerequisite for their engagement. Not as some nice option or f option for people who are at the top of the organizational ladder. They also, here's the third difference, they expect change cycles, how quickly you go from look, seeing a problem to solving it to changing to making it normal again, that whole cycle. They expect that these change cycles, these problem solving cycles, will happen quickly, very quickly. They expect even complex changes to happen quickly, complex change cycles. This is especially, perhaps even particularly true as it applies to their own jobs. They have very little patience for slow, slow, slow plotting change. And they also have very short attention spans. What was that? Squirrel. <laughs> it's amazing how deep that runs in the workforce today. We could talk all day long about why that is true. Here's the fourth big change in today's workforce. They expect robust lives outside of work. Work isn't their entire life, and they want to give everything they can to the workplace, but they need to be able to step away and want to and have a robust life outside of work. 
A fifth change is they want to work somewhere that they can brag about. They want to be proud of the place that they work, not embarrassed. Here's a sixth change. They need lots of feedback, preferably face-to-face -face feedback. Now that does tend to skew more toward the younger side of the workforce, but there's no clear demarcation that that never is expected in the older side of the workforce. People really do expect lots of feedback, preferably face-to-face. -face. They do well when they get meaningful feedback right away. And feedback, by the way, is just information. It's not criticism. The seventh difference is that they come into the workplace with a preference. These are, again, probably mostly younger folks in the workforce. There's no hard line, like if you're, if you're 28 or younger or 38 or younger, there's no hard line in there, but it generally skews this way, that folks that, that tend to be a little bit younger in the workforce come in with a preference for individual work and individual success over team work and team success. That's mostly because a lot of them have never experienced a high performance team in their life, anywhere in their life, so they don't even know what to expect. The eighth difference is that their default is mobile. And that, uh, that relates to the connected comments that I made a few moments ago. They are defaulting to mobile. Why do we have to be right here, right now to do this work? We have to justify that to people. Uh, we can't just assume that their default is stationary in one place at one time. Uh, and, and in the office, so to speak, or out on the floor, so to speak. Um, their default is mobile, so why isn't everything else mobile? Why can't I get information that I need walking around and going anywhere? We've got to deal with that. I think most of that is good. And here's the surprise for the ninth big difference. This is especially with the newest people in the workplace. They tend to prefer stability and predictability regarding their job so that they can have a life outside of work. They're not motivated, most of them, by the overtime mindset. They really do not have the kind of mindset that maybe a generation or two ago had in the workforce. So, okay, define and hire for competencies. Always be recruiting. If you're a leader or a manager or a supervisor, or somebody who's influencing others to be better and to do a better job, recruitment is part of your job. And always hire for competencies. There you go. This is a good introduction to our four video series. Hiring is hard, but don't make it harder than it needs to be. Next time, let's look at the interview section and the section where we figure out, are we going to hire that person or not? Have fun. Here's to you.